This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, Fritz Lang, 1890 to 1976, was one of the most celebrated filmmakers of the last century, working first in Weimar, Germany, then in Hollywood. Later audiences know him best for Metropolis, a groundbreaking dystopian vision of the silent era or for crime movies, such as The Big Heat in 1953. Yet others, such as M, his first film with sound, have been even more influential, and with his earlier silent film Mapuza the Gambler, even more disturbing. With me to discuss Fritz Lang are Iris Lupa, Senior Lecturer in Film Studies in the Division of Film and Media at London South Bank University, Joan McElhaney, Professor of Film Studies at Hunter College City University of New York, and Stella Brucci, Professor of Film and Dean of Arts and Humanities at University College London. Stella Brucci, if you were to sit down in a Berlin cinema in the 1920s and know nothing about the film playing, what would make you think, ah, this is Fritz Lang? Firstly, I think you need to think, uh, thinking about Berlin in the 1920s, Lang shared with many of his contemporaries fellow filmmakers, a playwright, Bertolt Brecht, uh, with whom he later collaborated on Hangman Also Die, film critics and theorists such as uh, Siegfried Krakow and many others, the experience of World War I, the Weimar period and then the birth of Nazism. This kind of background is, I think, absolutely crucial. As, I, as, as you know, Just as the 1920s rose out of the ashes of World War I, the decade was also a golden era for cinema, not just in Germany but in Hollywood and in Russia. It was a medium of spectacle and of modernity, and I think that's what one thinks of when one thinks of Fritz Lang's early films. It was a hugely exciting moment. Films such as Metropolis exemplified that excitement, its futurist vision and the spectacle, just the sheer spectacle of movement. One thing to say about Fritz Lang is he himself had fought in the First World War uh, and uh, a shrapnel had gone in one of his eyes. uh, One of his eyes was was out of commission and he wore a black patch sometimes. Um, So that was just to add to what you said about the First World War. Yes, no, absolutely. That's that's quite crucial. He didn't just take the I the kind of legacy of the First World War, but he really carried the First World War with him. What would you say? Oh, this is a Fritz Lang film. There are two ways of looking at that. One is that there's a certain thematic consistency to Lang's films. The arguably predictable preoccupation in the early films with, for example, mob rule and group think, which is carried on into the later films. And his more than slightly obsessive scrutiny um, of justice, characters who turn evil, for example. There's also very clearly the the visual intensity of Lang's work, especially the early stuff. Not only the conventional expressionist traits of exaggerated lighting, looming shadows, angular sets, but also the more Langian touches of the reflection in the mirror or the shop front, for example, the ripples of light uh, shed by torrential rain falling against uh, falling against windows. There's the interest in stylistic excess, the long shadows, distorted angles, dramatic futuristic sets. But but in Lang, you get someone who really lives and breathes cinema. What else was being made in Germany at that time that stands comparison with Fritz Lang? Just a brief... Was he on his own or was, what, was he one of several? No, he was... De- no, 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 Fritz Lang was definitely one of several. I mean, I think, you know, there were... Firstly, the way that one thinks about or one contextualises Lang are all the German slash Austrians who, with the rise of Nazism, went to Hollywood. There was Fred Zinnemann, there was William Wyler, there was uh, uh, Wilhelm um, Murnau, Robert Siodmak, Douglas Sirk, you know, or, uh, Billy Wilder. But if you think of him, so there are all those filmmakers who later went on to kind of define Hollywood, really, if you like, and created film noir. But going back to the 1920s in Germany, there, I mean, the kind of big expressionist flagship films that, you know, were alongside Fritz Lang were, for example, Robert Wiener's Cabinet of Dr Caligari, Murnau's Nosferatu, the first Dracula film, G.W. Pabst. Pandora's Box, starring Louise Brooks as a female seductress. These were the sorts of films 
alongside him. And for example, I mean, it was a hu- it was a really it was a concentration of filmmaking that one saw in um, in uh, Berl- in Berlin and Germany at the time. Even Alfred Hitchcock went to work as an assistant director in. Uh, Potsdam in 1924 and you see expressionism really feeding into and bleeding into his third film The Lodger which he made when he came back to the UK so well, that's a that's a terrific summary so there's, there's a great richness there uh, thank you Iris Looper uh, how did Fritz Lang get into filmmaking in the first place and get started yeah, so um, Fritz Lang, he was born and raised in Vienna and uh, he was um, enrolled to study architecture when he discovered that he preferred painting and he enrolled in the fine arts um, in Vienna University instead. He was quite influenced by the paintings of Egon Schiele, uh, Gustav Klimt, and he also spent some time in Paris where he uh, went to galleries and studied painting. Um, but in August 1914, Lang returned to Vienna and voluntarily enrolled enrolled in the army in 1915 and he served in the infantry. And it was in 1916 uh, that when Lang was convalescing uh, in Vienna after having received uh, an injury at the Eastern Front, which is the um, you know, the, the shrapnel in the eye that uh, we referred to earlier, uh, that he met um, another film director called Joe, Joe May, who was a fellow Austrian like Lang. And after being discharged from the army in August of 1918, again due to injury, Lang met up uh, with uh, Erich Pommer, who was um, a Weimar uh, film producer and who owned a production company called Deckler. And at this point, Pommer invites Lang to come to to Berlin and uh, work as a scriptwriter for Deckler. So Lang then writes several quite successful scripts for Deckler. Lang was promoted to direct his own script, Die Spinnen, Die the Spiders, which is another serial adventure movie. Of the early films, can you talk about Mabuza the Gambler? What makes that stand out? It... So Mabuza the Gambler uh, premiered in one of um, Berlin's splendid picture palaces in the spring of 1922. And um, um, we could think about of Dr Mabuza, who... On the surface, is yeah, he says a respectable psychoanalyst, uh, but in reality, is this master criminal, hypnotist, and murderer. We could think of him as a symbol of corruption, the duplicity, and the power struggles during that uh, politically instability. And, yeah, but you um, could think of him as as the man he was, and he was he was a gambler. He hypnotized the people he gambled with, and therefore tended to win all the time. He fiddled with the stock ex- stock market and so on. He was a swindler, right, left, and centre, and a terrible man. Uh, nothing stood in the way of his quest for power and money through gambling of various sorts. He plays with stock market shares, with money, with cards, with people and their destinies, and is that actually. Um, this gives us this, uh, this enticing idea of the similarity between the character of Dr. Mabuza and the role of the film director. So the way that Mabuza has power over all the characters and conjures up these fantastic images and visions. Um, there's a moment in part two of Dr. Mabuza where Lang gives a lecture in suggestion and mass hypnosis, where he hypnotizes a whole theatre audience to see... Um, images and visions of a caravan with camels and uh, servants walking through the through the lecture theatre, um, which we as audience in the cinema share. And perhaps, again, a very uh, telling moment is the opening moment of part one of Dr. Mabuse, where we see the opening shot of um, someone holding a set of cards, and the cards are portraits of... Um, the same man in various disguises. We then have uh, a dissolve to the second shot and we have this incredible moment where the the stack of playing cards is dissolved onto the face of Dr. Mabuse. We see him shuffling the cards and then he picks his first disguise of, of um, an elderly stockbroker and that sets the action in motion. Thank you very much. Joe, Joan McElhaney, what kind of reputation was Lang starting to make at this stage, especially with the film that Iris has just talked Mm -hmm. about? Well, the 1920s really marked the high point, I would say, of Lang's international reputation. And he didn't do it alone, though. There were two key figures here, uh, Eric Palmer, whom Iris has already mentioned, and the other is the writer Tay Van Harbu. And he met Van Harbu, Lang did, in 1920, and they began collaborating on screenplays. 
Uh, and in fact, she would go on to write or co-write all of his screenplays up through the testament of Dr. Mabuza in 1930, in 1933. And she was also frequently on the set of these films. Now, uh, they married in 1922, and that was the same year he became a German citizen. But if I can go back one year to 1921, which was a key year for them, because uh, that was the year they made uh, the allegorical drama, The Weary Death, or Destiny, as it was called in English speaking countries. And that was really a breakthrough success for them. Uh, it was a film Hitchcock and Luis Buñuel would later cite as uh, a crucial for film for them and showing them that the cinema now was truly a distinctive art form. Uh, and for the next few years, they could do no wrong, I would say. Uh, and Lang was helped in no small measure uh, here by Eric Palmer, uh, first through his company, Decla Bioscope, which is where Destiny was made, and then as the head of production at Uva Studios when Decla was absorbed into Ufa. What changed? Let's can we move to Metropolis in 1927, a massive film, and for many people, mm -hmm. the, the one people remember most. First of all, the film was the most expensive production in the history of Ufa Studios, and it was designed by Palmer to be a film, along with Murnau's Faust, made a year earlier, to compete with Hollywood, to show that the Germans could make a film on the same kind of scale and the same kind of international appeal uh, of Hollywood. Uh, the film was, as was Faust, uh, a huge financial failure. Uh, it was such a failure that, in fact, Palmer lost his job at Ufa. For those listeners who don't know, can you just say what the central story was? The core of Metropolis is the story of a young man named Freder, who's the son of uh, the owner of Metropolis, uh, this huge uh, city, a metropolis and uh, that employs factory workers who are exploited by uh, by this head of Metropolis, the, the father figure that Freighter is rebelling against. Freighter falls in love with a woman named Maria, who is um, trying to lead the workers into a much more enlightened state and to effectively to revolt against the master, and Freighter becomes involved in this particular situation. He did an immense amount of clashing of different styles inside it, didn't he? Metropolis, yes, in particular. Yes. Uh, because there's the, there is, first, first of all, the fairy tale element, uh, the gothic romantic element. There is the biblical element. Uh, there is the futurist element. There is the allegorical. All of these, and I'm probably leaving out about six or seven other things going on in this film. Uh, it is so layered in terms of what Lang and von Harbour were attempting here. Uh, I think it was just too much cinema for people at once uh, when it opened. Buñuel reviewed it, and he said that the story was uh, fast, completely moronic, uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, a completely banal story. But he said the spectacle of it was just stunning, just overwhelming and uh, truly innovative. Stella Celebruzzi, in 1931, Lang made M., his first film with sound, a talkie, if you like, well, half talkie, what opportunity did sound give to him? I thought I think that N is is an amazing film. I would say um, Fritz Lang's masterpiece. It tells the story of a character M of the title called Becker, played by Peter Lorre, a city terrorised by someone who is abducting and killing children, and they chase down Peter Lorre. A wonderful illustration of the integration of the visual expressiveness that one sees in Lang's film is the first time that we see Becker, the Peter Lorre character. The schools have just finished for lunch. This is where, where it all starts. Yes, there's a nursery rhyme that, that um, there's a little girl walking home, bouncing a ball. She bounces the ball against a poster offering a 10,000 marks reward for any information that will lead to the capture of the child murderer. The shot lingers, a visual clue straight away that this is a more than passing detail. Then the silhouette of a hatted man comes into view, casting a shadow over that poster, in particular the word murder. The silhouette looks down a little and the childish voice of Peter Lorre says, what a pretty ball you have there. It inclines towards the little girl and says, what's your name? Elsie Beckman, she says. There's a cut at that point, not to the man himself. We still don't know who this person is, but rather to the, to the mother we've seen earlier preparing lunch, an edit which is hugely ominous. With maximum economy, we realise through a deft combination of sound and image the full danger of this moment. 
We then see M again, but uh, from the back. So again, we don't see Peter Laurie's face. A high angle shot of him buying Elsie a balloon from the blind street seller. His whistling greegs in the hall of the Mountain King. And if I can, there's a nice point of trivia, which is that Peter Laurie couldn't whistle. So that that's actually Fritz Lang whistling that you hear on the soundtrack. M must think he's safe from uh, detection, but clearly isn't. The whistle is therefore a kind of sound equivalent of the shadow, another light motif that functions as a shorthand for M. So you see the integration of sound and image very clearly. After a few minutes later, two ominously silent shots come of a child's ball rolling across scrubland and a balloon entangled in telephone wires before uh, drifting up, perhaps into void, perhaps to heaven, we don't know. It's fascinating, the power of the silence. Iris, do you want to add to that and take the story on, as it were? So this little girl we know has been uh, murdered. And yes. What happens next that's significant and significantly new in this half-sound, half-silent film? So I think the way um, that, that Elsie's death is actually depicted through, through a set of objects, you know, the, the empty chair at the kitchen table, the empty staircase, and as we said, the... Uh, the ball that rolls out of the hedge and the balloon tangled up in the wire. And they're powerful images that, interestingly, as a spectator, keep us in, in a somehow detached, detached observational position, which is quite remarkable considering uh, the topic. But interestingly, the film doesn't sustain this um, this this mode of filmmaking. And actually what the film does, it moves on to kind of really testing our viewing habits and and checking whether we as audience are able to play close attention to what's happening on screen. So following the death immediately is then we don't return ever to the children or the, the mothers until the very last shot of the film. And instead, the film uh, invites us to focus on the mass hysteria that is created um, by the murders and, of course, then the race between the police and the ring organisations, the criminal organisations of Berlin. So the film takes us through the, the press coverage, the police and the criminal detection and how it gets underway. And, um, you yeah, so Lang uses sound bridges and parallel montage to blur the distinction between the police and the criminals. And he then even goes a step further by aligning us closer and closer with the criminals. So the police are presented as, you know, kind of bumbling and um, forensic but slow, whereas the petty criminals are really wily and effective, especially when they enlist the help of the city's beggars in finding the murderer. If I may say, the petty criminals gang together and this man is ruining their profession. Mm -hmm. uh, that every one of them is being <laughs> examined, every one of them is suspected of being the murderer and they can't get on with being criminals, really. Uh, exactly. And they decide mm -hmm. that they will track him down. Um, Joe, do you want to take us to what Fritz Lang is saying about the moral degradation of M? Uh, we have this heavily built man, Peter Lorre, in this trilby hat, most of them got trilby hats, intent on the most terrible deed. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Lang said his intent in making the film was to uh, create a picture of a society in the grip of self-destructive urges. And I think that's manifested in the film in, in several interesting ways. And we can begin, for example, with the title itself and what the letter M represents, which is most obviously murder. But also the lines on the palm of every hand have the letter M on it, which is the line of fate. So the hand in this film performs several functions. When one of the criminals draws a chalk mark on the M line of his hand, he uses this as a way to, of imprinting the letter M on the back of Hans Beckert's jacket so that it not only becomes a mark of shame, it's also a trace of something left behind so that Beckert can be tracked down and caught. And Lang cinema increasingly becomes a cinema of traces, inscriptions, marks, things left behind, and often related to crime. But there is also... And The Hunt. Yeah, and The Hunt, absolutely, yes. There's a film, one of his anti-Nazi films in Hollywood is called Manhunt. But there's also the importance of gesture to the film and how gestures connote this aspect of a degraded, self-destructive, or simply destructive society. Uh, the ways that Peter Lorre's... Hans Beckert indicates his helplessness in the face of his own urges, uh, quite often is done through gesture, uh, in particular the trial sequence uh, with his fat hands. and. St but even before the trial sequence, there's that wonderful sequence where he sees the girl through the shop window mm -hmm. in the toy shop 
and he turns and he puts his hand to his mouth yes. to, 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 and he sort of just takes a deep breath in and resets himself and you think now he's going to go and do the terrible thing. Yes, yes, this, this trying to uh, contain this sense. Of, he says yeah. when he's on trial, I can't help myself, I can't help myself. Um, and you see that through gesture, but he's, you know, he has the body of a child and the hands of a child. Uh, and one of the sort of ironies of the film really is the fact that these children in the film, the children aren't afraid of him. Uh, they don't run from him. They happily sing about him in the opening sequence of the film. One day the man in black will come along and chop your head off. They don't care. It's the, the adults who are frightened of all this or the, the adults who want to rise up and, uh, and get rid of this Hans Beckert who's making their lives more complicated than they need to be. And the character of Schranker, uh, the gangster thief, is so interesting in, in relation to this because in the trial sequence, for example, his hands are always covered in leather gloves so he doesn't leave any trace of himself, any fingerprints behind. And when he's uh, in the trial sequence, uh, he's constantly pointing his index finger at, at Hans Beckert, uh, hypocritically convinced of his own moral rightness. Stella, can we go to that kangaroo court? It's been, uh, it's been mentioned two or three times. Very swiftly, Beckett realises that he'd be better off in a real court of law. There's this lovely tight pen along the faces of the criminals and, uh, as their leader declares that they're going to try him. And there they are, kind of packed into the basement of this dilapidated distillery. But... The institution of law is always, in Fritz Lang films, severely limited in terms of its inability or ability to mete out justice. And here you get, very ironically, the city's criminals whose uh, livelihoods are, are seriously threatened and curtailed by the child killer's activities, putting on trial this child murderer. You, you get them, though, however, giving him a defence attorney, another petty criminal, which is really interesting because he raises the issue about should we be actually killing this person? Because one of the most moving sequences, and it's very it's a classic Fritz Lang moment, really, is that we've we you know we've kind of hated Beckett, but as but as Joe said, you know, obviously Peter Laurie is very childlike, rotund, huge eyes big pudgy fingers, just like kind of toddlers, really, toddlers' fingers. He's described very movingly how, how he feels this compulsion to kill. So, and there's yes. this wonderful monologue and done in wonderful close-ups. In, in Laurie's monologue, it, he details these compulsions and the voices that he hears is actually the most emotional it's the emotional core of the film, it's the most emotional speech. So we as the spectators are really torn. It is talked about us being detached and, and observational. For most of the time we are, but here we're suddenly thrown into the turmoil, if you like, of the true ambiguities of finding the truth, of executing justice. I mean, should we execute this person? And also the straightforwardness of him saying, I can't help it, I have to do it, and you cut to some of the criminals nodding as if they too have been in that position. Yes, but then you cut later, just a few moments later, to the mothers saying, kill the murderer, kill the murderer, you know. So yes. you've got this real kind of tension at the, you know, so that, and the open-endedness of the ending, the, amb the ambivalence of the ending, tells us that actually there's no straightforward way of interpreting Beckett at all. We never no. find out what Beckett's punishment will be. Yeah. Iris, um, following the rise of the Nazis, Lang left Germany in 1933, and he said he'd made... Goebbels and decided that that was enough for him and gone home, packed a bag, caught a train to Paris uh, and never came back. But it wasn't quite as easy as that, was it? No, not at all. So um, we have got um, Lang's, if you like, uh, kind of own um, film script, almost like fictional account of, of how he had this meeting with Goebbels and he was looking at the, the clock on the wall and, and he was just hoping he'd catch the last train to Paris. So that's not what happened. Um, what we do know for sure is that um, in uh, spring 1933, uh, Goebbels saw the testament of Dr. Mabuse and he decided that it uh, it should be banned. So it, it uh, couldn't premiere. And um, we also um, know, or it is quite possible that Lang was present when Goebbels uh, delivered his first speech to, to German filmmakers um, you know, in, in early uh, 1933. 
Um, what Lang then does, he, he travels quite freely between Paris and Berlin um, quite a few times, but finally leaves Berlin um, for Paris in July of 1933 and then spends almost a year in Paris where he makes a, a film for Erich Pommer and, um, uh, and Fox Europa called Lilium. And at that point, he already starts making connections with David O. Selznick, who was producer at MGM. And when um, Fritz Lang finally arrives in, in the United States in July 1934, he arrives with a contract from MGM in his pocket, uh, which, of course, is, is a lot more than, than all the other exiles um, yes. often had and could take with them. Iris, why did he fib about, the, about his relationship with girls? I mean, he didn't rush home and pack a bag and catch a train immediately. He hung around for quite a while, then he travelled to and from Paris for the next uh, few weeks or even a few months. So what was he doing by doing that? I think you have to see it from the perspective of the the, the emigre who's trying to score brownie points in, in Hollywood. So, you know, the I more see. Lang presents himself as, as being this kind of anti kind of anti Nazi director, you know, who couldn't uh, you know, who was offered the biggest position in, in the German film industry but turns his back on it uh, because he doesn't agree with Nazi rule. That of course gives him brownie points. But it's it's interesting because Lang actually didn't have to to do any of that because um, b what is really striking about Lang's time in Hollywood and which not, not much gets talked about is his active engagement in humanitarian activities and causes in in terms of helping out and supporting emigrants still stuck in Europe. Um, Lang is instrumental in securing the financial means for Brecht to come to Hollywood and he you know so, so he doesn't kind of show his anti-Nazi sentiment, not just on screen, but in physically getting involved in trying to get people out out of Europe and, and uh, into America, which, which, which was, of course, the, the safe haven at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, Joe McElhenney, how did Hollywood change Lang as a filmmaker? Well, we could talk on the one hand of the production circumstances or conditions of these films. Um, Lang, like so many European emigre and refugee film artists in the 30s and 40s, had difficulties in adapting to Hollywood methods, to having such oversight from producers and studio executives. He was also much more autocratic than actors and crew members were used to, so he alienated a number of people when he first arrived in Hollywood. Uh, he also built up, though, some positive uh, professional relationships uh, with certain collaborators, the producer Walter Wanger, uh, also the actors Sylvia Sidney and Joan Bennett. And he also had a very productive relationship with a number of screenwriters. Now, uh, he was very prolific uh, during his Hollywood period. Now, the Hollywood films are perhaps, certainly for many people, not as formally audacious as some of his German films. But I think they're no less interesting or important uh, than what he was doing in Germany. So we, it might be more productive to ask not whether his Hollywood films are as good as his German films, but what links we can draw between the German and Hollywood films while also being aware of differences. And I think the central obsession running throughout Lang's Hollywood work is how do these things we call reality and the truth become constructed? become a matter of appearances rather than being simple facts, givens. And uh, the world of appearances in Lang's American films takes place through the recurring use of things like audiovisual media, uh, the world of fiction, of journalism, through art, uh, through cinema, through politics, and through the criminal justice system. And they all construct their own versions of the truth, which is repeatedly shown by the films to be a construct but which nevertheless completely entraps the protagonists. It's almost as though the protagonists of these films cannot fight against the overwhelming tide of false appearances that dominate American culture, to the point where the protagonist often becomes the appearance, the image, which they and we know to be false. Stella, where in, in Hollywood do you think Lang was struggling with the same themes as he had in Germany, or, as has been implied, by Joe, uh, he had to change quite a lot. M was the first of several trial films. Most obviously his first Hollywood movie, the Spencer Tracy film Fury, in which he has a more standard courtroom and there you get the audiovisual evidence, you know, in the form of a newsreel that Joe's has described right through to his last Hollywood film Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. 
uh, from 1956, which is all about probing evidence, reality. So often in Lang's films, the official judicial systems are found to be wanting and not to be trusted. They're ineffectual, wayward, capricious. That's not how you get to the truth. How you get to the truth is through, for example, the randomness of luck, just a piece of, just a fluke, a uh, slip of the tongue, for example, just someone suddenly remembering something, putting two and two together, which leads to, for example, Anne Baxter's acquittal at the end of The Blue Gardenia. Right triumphing over wrong in Lang's films has very little to do with the competencies of the institutions of law. And all of this goes back, I think, to what you see, see in M. There, and then he takes forward, there are vestiges of the German films. I mean, there's the, there's the uh, mob rule that you get in Fury, for example. I know that's an early film. But you get the kind of the arbitrariness, uh, I think, touching on what, um, extending what, what, what Joe's talked about, the kind of arbitrariness of the dividing line between good and evil is so often shown on the level of performance and on the level of lighting and on the level of style. So when, I mean, for example, Joe Wilson, the Spencer Tracy character in in Fury, who's been presumed killed in, in the jailhouse fire as the lynch mob set, set the jailhouse on fire and he, he's assumed to have died, he escapes and arrives at his brother's apartment. His Tracy's entire expression, his voice, his demeanour are all altered from the cheery, happy-go-lucky Joe before to this brooding, noirish figure who actually has a kind of almost vampiric aversion to the light. He gets his brothers to turn the light off. And you see the same uh, yeah. in the big heat. Iris, how successful were Lang's Hollywood collaborations with Brecht and Weil? You've mentioned that he helped them. Lang will always say he was a lifelong admirer of Brecht. And uh, they, they both started um, working on an outline for a film uh, um, called Hangman Also Die, um, about the uh, depicting the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, um, the deputy rice protector for Bohemia and Moravia in May 1942. And it's as early as June. So literally just uh, a month later that Brecht and Lang start collaborating uh, on an outline for a story about the assassination and then the subsequent uh, brutal retribution and revenge taken out on the Czech civilians by the Gestapo. And we know a lot about this collaboration due to Brecht's journal entries. Um, and it's wonderful to hear Stella talk about um, those strokes of luck and, and flukes uh, in Lang's stories, because this is exactly what, what irritates Brecht about working with Lang writing on a script where he says, you know, Lang introduces these ridiculous plot twists like an injured resistance fighter hiding behind a curtain during a Gestapo house search and they don't find him. And uh, he becomes so frustrated by that. And he says, Lang just says the audience will accept it. Um, and he finds that incredible that, that Lang just thinks, no, the audience will accept it. You know, they, and um, Brecht also mentions that Lang seems to be more interested in surprise than creating suspense. Eventually, you know, Lang passes the, the, the rest of the script writing on to Brecht and the young uh, American author John Wexley, and they present him with a 208-page long script, which is twice the length of your average um, Hollywood script. So Lang cuts it down by half to fit in with the shooting schedule, and um, that deeply, deeply upsets Brecht and humiliates him. What you could argue is so that despite all of Brecht's reservations about the collaboration, uh, Hangman also dies, an incredibly hard hitting topical film. So despite the ludicrous plot twists and the inevitable love story, um, you know, that there are moments of, of real pathos when we see um, the sacrifices that were made by the, by the Czech civilians to resist the Nazi occupation, and if anything, what we can take from Hangman also by, die is this clash between the playwright, who will always prioritise the word, versus the film director, who believes in the power of the images and lets the image do the talking. Thank you. Joe, uh, we mentioned the big heat. Uh, do you want to tell us how you think it relates to Lang's other's work? Uh, Lang's other work in quality. I mean, it's a very interesting film in relation to what we've been talking about so far in terms of the Hollywood films versus the German films, or the Hollywood films and the German films. But I think we have in The Big Heat one of Lang's most perfectly achieved American works. 
and it's deceptively simple in style. So there's uh, little of the interest in constructing uh, the world of little highs and lows from Metropolis and M. The film is mainly shot at eye level. Uh, the more heavily symbolic language of his German and early films in America is muted. What we have instead is a very uh, remarkable, I think, tight causality, a compressed intensity. But as an M, everything in this film is connected to something else but it, perhaps in a less emphatic manner than an M. But what you have, again, connecting the big heat to M, is this idea of the world of crime, the world of politics, the world of law and order, all being intimately connected with one another. And so, like M, it's a film about degradation, about garbage, the gutter, filth, but where things look clean. So it's really about these facades of respectability. I don't like gutter talk, says the gangster Mike Lagana. Uh, but what the big heat gives us that M does not is, uh, I, you may call him, I guess this figure, the mediator, an in-between figure, and that's Dave Banyan, the Glenn Ford character of the police sergeant. He's a very moral individual, uh, but his morality is so inflexible that it causes uh, a number of violent, unfortunate events to occur because he doesn't think anything through. He simply acts on the basis of his immediate moral response to something, and this indirectly leads to the death of his wife, the murder of his wife, a, something a, a bomb intended uh, for him that she receives and said when she steps inside of the car and turns it on. Um, so... What we have in this film, this tight causality, creates an impression that every action performed has a dimension, a consequence, and revenge comes to dominate the second half of the film. And Dave, in the second half, after the death of, death of his wife, assumes a tragic dimension. Stella, um, is he still, is he breaking new ground here? Or is he reworking old ideas? What he's done is more, I think, honed his style and honed his interest. You get Banyan saying um, the Glenn Ford character being as inflexible as Joe says, but you get Lang, as he always has done through his career, using, using style to undercut that and to show the, the ambiguities there. So when, after his wife's murder, he goes from being kind of smiling and uh, brightly lit to becoming far more ambivalent and emotionally complex, in a way going to the dark side of the gangsters, a transition that's marked uh, in various scenes by him becoming characterised by the kind of, you know, by surrounded by the expressionist gloom and the destabilising shadows that you see around Lee Marvin and, and that side of it. I mean, in terms of his style, Lang's films get gradually less stylized and less visually extravagant. So it's, it isn't that I think Lang develops away from the German, he just refines it. Thank you. Iris, was he ever seen as tarnished by his Weimar films? The two things that, that uh, perhaps could have tarnished um, the Weimar films is, A, perhaps um, uh, having a, a, a wife who's a member of the Nazi party as, a, as your writing partner, um, uh, so there yes, was, his wife was, the, a, and stayed on. Did he? He left. She didn't leave with him, and she rose exactly, in the Nazi yeah. hierarchy and got very good jobs there. Yes. Yes. So Thea von Harbour. So um, Lang actually divorced uh, von Harbour in early 1933. So in that year, yeah, literally none for everything happened. So he gets divorced from Harbour. Testament of Mabuse is banned, and uh, he turns his back on Germany. But um, so apart from perhaps the, the whatever we might say, perhaps about. Uh, his political leanings, um, we, I think the actions speak louder than words. You know, the fact that he leaves Germany, um, leaves Thea von Harbour behind and becomes so actively involved in, in fighting the Nazis on screen and in all his um, you know, voluntary help for organisations and emigrants. Um, the other thing that, that slightly tarnished the reputation was the publication of two books um, shortly after the end of the world, Second World War by Secret Krakauer, uh, called From Caligari to Hitler and Lottie Eisner's The Haunted Screen. Um, and in those books, particular Secret Krakauer um, makes the link between, if you like, Weimar film culture and political history. And what uh, Krakauer argued was that um, the Weimar cinema is littered with all these um, criminals, tyrants, mad scientists, hypnotists, magicians, and that uh, that uh, in some way you can read the films of the Weimar period as almost a premonition 
of the rise of Nazism and Hitler. And of course, you know, Lang's, Lang's films were amongst the ones that he singled out. So Dr. Mabuse um, and Metropolis as these films, which are already almost sub subfused with um, this kind of dark, dark ideology that kind of rises to the fore in the 1930s. Thank you very much. Joe, finally, um, who did Fritz Lang most influence? Uh, the influence of Lang is, is, is very complicated and is perhaps not as clear or straightforward as, for example, Hitchcock's is. I would say the, the, uh, the movement, the film movement that perhaps embraced Lang uh, most clearly, most strongly would have been, a, would have been the French New Wave. Um, there is, for example, Lang playing himself in Godard's 1963 film Contempt. Um, and uh, then there's Jacques Rivette's first feature, Paris Belongs to Us, where a, a clip from Metropolis uh, is shown. Claude Chabrol uh, has also stated that uh, Lang was actually a more important and influential figure for him than Hitchcock, uh, because even though Chabrol co-wrote the first book late study of Hitchcock's films. But it's, it's uh, uh, I think perhaps for Hitchcock, Lang's influence was strong, but... Um, not one that Hitchcock wanted to embrace. And in fact, I'm sure Hitchcock felt that he, whatever it was that he took from Lang, he also took that in a very different direction. And that direction he took it in, Hitchcock, I think also accounts for his much greater success, both at the time he was making films and in the years since. But I think more recently, perhaps someone like Michael Mann has also certainly spoken of the importance of Lang's work. And The Big Heat is a particularly important film uh, for Scorsese. And I think the ethics at work in a film like The Big Heat, this question of morality in relation to a flawed male protagonist uh, is something Scorsese certainly uh, responds to very strongly. You see this in a number of his films, even though I wouldn't call Scorsese's films particularly Langian. But you can see the influence of M on David Fincher's film Seven, I think, very strongly as well. This idea of marginalizing the uh, the serial murder and then uh, creating a kind of allegorical space of, of corruption. Thank you very much, uh, Joe McElhaney and Stella Brucey and Iris Looper, and to our studio engineer, John Boland. We take a break next week, and then we're back on the 13th of January with the poetry of Thomas Hardy. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Basically, this next bit is for you to say now what you thought you... what you didn't have time to say in the programme... Iris, can we start um, with you? Yeah, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot more I'd like to say, but um, but I'll, I'll I'll limit it down perhaps to one point, which I think feeds both um, Melvin, what you had to say about the shop window sequence, and um, but f kind of, and, and that of course is again uh, the the link to Brecht. So I think perhaps what what we should think about is is the way in which Lang really aligns us with the criminals. You know, he because they're so so witty, so wily, you know, they really get onto the case of how to capture this murderer. And Lang at the time cast even the, the parts of the small petty criminals with very well-known Weimar uh, film and theatre actors, such as, you know, Theo Lingen, Rosa Valetti as the barmaid, Paul Kemp. And, um, and what is interesting is that he, when we get to the kangaroo point court and we realise how quick... Um, this, this, these friendly criminals turn into a lynch mob. Uh, perhaps we, we realize that, um, Lang, Lang has tricked us. You know, he's done one of these, what he does always, you know, he challenges us to really think about what we're seeing. Um, simultaneously in the representation of Beckett, Lang gives us a much more complex picture of the murderer than perhaps, uh, we first might think. So we start off, as Estella described beautifully, with um, you know the shadow on the advertising column, the idea of the murderer as the monster, the man in black, um, the, you know, the bogeyman from the children's rhyme. But as the film continues, Lang gives us this incredibly complex study of the murderer's struggle um, to, to suppress his urge to kill in the famous shop window sequence. And what I'd like to say briefly about the shop window sequence is a, um, that it's fascinating that we never see the murderer and the child in a two shot. So we never see both characters standing ne next to each other in the frame. What we get instead 
is again something Stella referred to, you know, with, with the idea of reflections and shop windows. The murderer sees the girl's image, which is reflected in a mirror, which is placed inside this wonderful display of, of crockery and knives in the shop window. So he's enticed by, by the image of this child. Um, we then get a close up of the most stunning moment of Peter Laura using facial expression and gesture to represent to us the struggle and then failing to resist the urge um, you know, to, to follow this child. And we see this, he's been munching an apple and we see him take the apple to his mouth with one hand and then using the other hand to try and stop himself. We see the struggle and then he drops both the hands and we, we, we see him uh, turn from this kind of, if you like, um, innocent flaneur into into this uh, psychopathic stalker. What makes the scene so interesting is, of course, the connection to Brecht in a way that, that um, Peter Laura at the time of working on M was also in a Brecht production. And we can say for sure that Brecht, um, that, that Peter Laura was trained in Brechtian techniques of acting, so the so-called demonstrational acting, where you try to appeal to the audience's reason and understanding in presenting social processes. Would you like to come in, Joe? Well, uh, what uh, I would have liked to have talked about is something that really interests me in terms of the uh, the American work, uh, but this also begins with M and the Testament of Dr. Mabuza, and that has to do with spoken or written language. And language, spoken language and, and, and written language in Lang's work is rarely the straightforward vehicle for communication. Its meaning is always questioned and uh, it becomes another terrain for interpretation. And they often have words, often have a dual or multiple significance. So that in Fury, for example, Joe repeatedly confuses the words memento with momentum. Uh, a seemingly innocent mistake, but that confusion over two words is germane to the entire project of Fury. And then if I can backtrack a bit or actually bring up the big heat again, uh, the chief hangout for the gangsters uh, in that film is a bar called The Retreat. Uh, and a character later in the film, a secretary at a wrecking company named Selma Parker, one of the crucial, many crucial women in the film, has trouble remembering the name of this bar, but she says it sounds like a monastery. You know, she says, a place where people go off to think. Uh, a crucial line and a crucial mistake or a crucial blank that she draws in this film where the act of thinking, of learning to think, uh, is absolutely fundamental. Um, now, revenge is central. Well, let's say something about revenge because it's so interesting. Well, the revenge, what's interesting about The Big Heat, because Dave Banyan feels like he's going to be the vengeful character. What happens in The Big Heat is the ultimate acts or gestures of vengeance occurred not by Dave, but actually by Debbie Marsh, the Gloria Graham character. Uh, this is a film about thought, about thinking, about thinking before you act and think through the consequences of what you're doing. Dave doesn't really do that. Debbie Marsh finally does, but only after her boyfriend, Vince Stone, another gangster, scalds her face, scars it by throwing hot coffee on it. And uh, so she goes into retreat uh, in Dave's hotel room. Uh, and she says uh, at one point that she has never thought before in her life until this moment. Now she's starting to think. And she actually exposes all the corruption in the city, makes it all come forward. I've never felt better in my life, she says, as she's about to kill the woman who is basically behind all, uh, not behind the corruption, but behind hiding the corruption. And this finally, this big heat, this gangster film, seemingly male-dominated genre, is finally, I would say, dominated... Uh, and shaped by the women. Uh, and the women of the film are very strongly connected and contrasted with each other in this very powerful way. Again, culminating in the confrontation between Debbie Marsh, bad girl who's really the good girl of the film, ultimately, and uh, the uh, the widow of um, uh, the policeman who commits suicide at the beginning of the film and pulls the secret, but the, wife, the widow is keeping these uh, in her safe deposit box. They're both wearing mink coats, but she says, Debbie says to her, uh, we're sisters under the mink. Stella, do you want to come in? Oh, and you needn't follow that. It's just anything that you... Yeah, no, I, I was, that, I, I was just thinking, stuff. Melvin, we're talk, we, we've talked a, a lot about, quite rightly, about Fritz Lang as a great stylist, but there's also something very kind of practical and schematic... There's a really practical and schematic dimension, I think, to to his filmmaking, to his plotting, to his 
his love of procedure, as I mentioned earlier, to the way that he concludes his films. There's a lot of emergency exits, as his fellow emigre Douglas Sirk might have put it, um, endings that either don't extend causally from what's transpired before or are the last-minute results of some new information coming to light or a sudden vault fast, as we get at the end of... Um, at the end of Fury, uh, which uh, Joe's just been talking about. And there's a real, I mean, there's also a sense thinking about that. He was a great stylist, but also he didn't perhaps quite know when to, when to give up. And I've always, I always wish I liked, well, his last film in Hollywood, Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, is his most schematic film. It's all about, um, it's it's so schematic, you can, it kind of, you know, it doesn't really, it can't, it's, very pared down, you can't really, doesn't really breathe as a film. The acting is pretty wooden, I think. The film is pretty wooden because it's all just a ruse. It's sort of uh, the central premise, which is overly schematic, is a writer, Dana Andrews, setting out to prove that an innocent man can be found guilty and, and executed by framing himself for a murder that he didn't commit, only he did commit it, but then he makes a little error at the end, the kind of, you know, memento, memento type error. There's a little slip of the tongue, which then proves he was guilty after all. And you can feel the the cogs, you can feel and see, sense the cogs working. And it's really... I, I would have liked to have asked Fritz Lang why he wanted to make a film like that, which had all of his favourite films around justice, around human nature, around slips, around chance, around luck, and do it so badly. But one that I didn't have the... I, I know there are some people um, who really love the film. I've watched it so many times. I wish I did. Um, but there's a kind of... You can see, in a sense, it's the, it's the quintessential Fritz Lang film, but it has none of the style... And I, so I think he was a deeply ambivalent figure, really, because of that. He was a great stylist, but he didn't always use it. And I just would have liked to have had the long conversations with him about when he made those choices, really. I actually love Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. I think it's an amazing Do you? film. Yeah, but, you yeah, see, I just, so I'm in that camp. I just yeah. don't... I wish <laughs> I did. I just kind of... I would... Because I, I, I write about justice, I write about the law so mm-hmm. many times, and I just I look at Joan Fontaine's performance, and I just think, how could you get such a bad performance out of Joan Fontaine? I love Joan mm-hmm. Fontaine. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's part of the mm-hmm. allegorical mm-hmm. impulse at work here. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. just like empty it of any kind of obvious uh, human expression because it's about something else, something larger, mm-hmm. yeah. more important. It's a world mm-hmm. that's already and I think, dead. Yeah. Hmm. And I think it's interesting, Stella, because what you touch on is something that uh, critics uh, of his Weimar films, of so Weimar film critics at the time, often accused Lang of. So with Metropolis, um, one critic said, this is ridiculous. How can you make an ideological film without ideology? Um, in M, in M, uh, Lang was constantly accused of not taking sides, you know, and they said, well, is he for the death penalty or is he against... Um, but one critic then literally pointed out that perhaps um, his fellow colleagues have what he calls principles instead of eyes, because what he's saying is that actually fundamentally Fritz Lang's films are are much more concerned perhaps with um, seeing and blindness in the sense that you know the the narratives are so powerful and and Lang's mastery of cinematic techniques is so powerful that he can take us on a ride you know we he takes us along with the criminals you know with dr mabuse we're charmed by dr mabuse we we're completely complicit with the um with the criminals in m until they turn into a lynch mob um and it's interesting then perhaps to see how how quickly they um you know uh, resort to, to violent retribution uh, when when actually the film's character, the murderer, um, really struggles with the impulse uh, to, to 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 curb his own violence. And I think perhaps that Lang is, in, in many ways, you know, he is, I mean, it sounds big lip, but he is a filmmaker's filmmaker. He's interested in, um, in a very self-reflexive way, he's interested um, in, in the power of, of, of film, um, to to misguide the audience, you know, to 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 think, to make us think that we know everything that goes on, but only to reveal then to us that that we that we're partially sighted. Well, thanks very much. That was so good. 
In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. From the makers of the Battersea Poltergeist, a new podcast series for BBC Radio 4, Uncanny. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Have you seen one? Yes. Real life stories of the supernatural, told by the people they happen to. Presented by me, Danny Robbins. There is a very strong sense of pure evil. Subscribe to Uncanny on BBC Sounds.